Candace Bergen will always be remembered best for starring in the title role of Murphy Brown, one of TV's most popular sitcoms of all time, that ran for over 200 episodes between 1988 and 1998 before seeing a brief revival a couple of years ago in 2018. Candace would wind up winning five Emmys for her work on the series, and shortly after it came to an end in the late 90s, she met her second husband, Marshall Rose, an extremely wealthy real estate developer. Since then, Candace has lived in a few of the most jaw-dropping homes you could imagine, including a luxurious cottage in East Hampton that Rose originally built for himself and his first wife Jill in the mid-80s. Jill died in 1996, just one year after Candace's first husband, French film director Louis Ma, passed away himself. A few years later, these two had begun a new life together, moving into this gambrel-roofed cottage. Shortly after, the couple decided they wanted their country home to reflect the life they now shared and decided to splurge on some renovations. While Candace was fully on board with the decision, the challenge became finding a way to do so that didn't erase the home's character or the happy memories her husband had shared with his previous partner. She told Architectural Digest, It was a beautifully thought out house and it was a delicate challenge to respect its history but reinterpret it as ours. To help them strike the right balance, the couple invited one of Jill's former friends, Manhattan designer Alyssa Cullman, to spend the night and help Candace and Marshall come up with ideas that paid tribute to Jill's memory. After talking until midnight, everyone found themselves in agreement that while the house was gorgeous, it was far too formal for Candace's more casual tastes. Next, they had to convince the home's original architect, Jacques T. Robertson, to pitch in. As it turns out, that was easier said than done because Robertson was completely reluctant to make any changes at all. He said, It's as if you're asking me to operate on one of my own children. Well, after some more discussion, he eventually came around to understanding the couple's desire to make this home their own. Shortly after, Robertson got to work drawing up new plans, turning what had originally been designed as a summer house into a year-round retreat. Some of the tweaks were purely cosmetic in nature, while others were pretty big, including transforming the entire downstairs area into one giant loft, adding an enclosed porch for year-round entertainment, and swapping out formal decoration for cozier touches. Constructed on top of 1.8 acres of gorgeously landscaped grounds, along one of the wealthiest streets in all of East Hampton, Candace Bergen's estate hides behind a well-trimmed row of hedges and large trees. Boasting a total of six bedrooms as well as six and a half bathrooms within 4,500 square feet of space, one of the first things that you'll notice about the home is how light entirely covers the redesigned living room thanks to some massive floor to ceiling windows. Then there's the dining room, which pulls double duty as a library thanks to all of the literature lining the bookshelves along the back wall. In fact, that wall flows directly into the nearby window wrapped sitting room that then spills out into the backyard. As for the renovated kitchen, you'll spot a gigantic hot rack hanging over top a long work island where wooden counters have been paired with commercial grade stainless steel appliances. There's also a breakfast room with walls made out of windows that overlook the property's amazing gardens. Upstairs, a second floor lounge has become the social hub of the estate and sits comfortably between a series of guest bedrooms as well as the primary ensuite. Speaking of the master bedroom, Candace's personal retreat boasts overscaled carpets beneath a raised ceiling and includes a dressing room with built in dressers as well as a cottage style marble bath drenched in beadboard. Out back, the Dutch Gambrel roof hangs over top of a deep porch that runs the entire length of the home and provides views of a large stretch of lawn bordered on all sides by flower gardens. Last but not least, off to the side of the yard is an airy and open plan guest house, which boasts a swimming pool directly behind its premises. Once all the renovations to the home had been complete, even Robertson had to admit that the place looked better than ever. He told Architectural Digest, It has kept its architectural integrity. It's a very different house, but it's still the same. Candace and her hubby would continue to live here for almost two decades. But in 2020, they decided it was time to move on, listing the property for $18 million. Up until now, it doesn't appear as if anyone actually bid at that price point, which means this home is still 
still part of Candace's real estate portfolio. But it's not the only noteworthy property she owns. Candace Bergen has been a fan of New York City's Upper East Side as far back as 1979, which is when her incredible duplex, Views of Central Park, was profiled in Architectural Digest for the first time. Situated inside one of those old school New York City buildings from the 50s and 60s with high ceilings and pristine sight lines, Candace had her eyes on living here long before she moved in. She said, I've always loved this building, so when I had an opportunity to buy an apartment here, I didn't hesitate. Now this is my East Coast headquarters. When Candace originally arrived, the apartment had already been rented out multiple times with former tenants having left furniture and decor behind. In fact, one residence left two Art Deco bronze lamps that hang from the ceiling, while another installed a section of mirrored wall right in the middle of floor to ceiling windows. Candace got some friends to help her decide on a color palette involving earth tones like deep browns, wine dark maroons, and hints of cobalt blue. Then there's the two story studio like living room, a very white and monochromatic space that's been arranged under a dark blue ceiling. Not far from there is a Mexican inspired dining room table that can be closed off from the living room with the help of some bifold doors. Upstairs, Candace's bedroom is situated in the balcony space directly above the dining area. When its own bifold doors and window shutters are open, this room feels more like a floating platform than a bedroom, but when closed, it becomes the definition of cozy. What's more, just a couple of years ago, Candace and Marshall would buy a second apartment on Fifth Avenue inside a neoclassical 23-story building that was originally built in 1927 with 64 apartments and views of Central Park. Considering what a big deal Candace's husband is in the New York City business world, it only makes sense that they have options when it comes to where to spend the night in the Big Apple. But even I can't think of many people wealthy and successful enough to own two Fifth Avenue zip codes. Then again, when you're some of the most accomplished and recognizable faces in the history of TV like Candace Bergen, I'm sure you can afford it. All right, everyone, thanks so much for watching today's house tour. Before you leave, consider answering the following question. Would you ever move into a home that your partner once shared with someone else? Let me know if you'd be comfortable doing that or if you'd initiate a full scale tear down in the comments below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to make sure you never miss a video. My name's Kara the Vampire Slayer, and if you want to check out another tour before you go, stay tuned for our look into the homes of Jack Nicholson. Bye! Jack Nicholson is one of the most recognizable names in all of Hollywood, having starred in such classics as The Shining, As Good As It Gets, and many, many more. But after spending more than half a century in the industry, Jack's name has also become infamous because of both how and where he lived. Recently, Jack's friends have begun expressing their concern for his safety and well-being, considering he's barely been seen in public since 2021. In fact, multiple sources have told media outlets that Jack doesn't leave his house anymore because his mind's slowly slipping away. We'll get into how true or not those rumors might be in a little bit. But first, I'm going to tell you everything there is to know about Jack Nicholson's Beverly Hills estate. These days, Jack Nicholson spends most of his time living off-grid in the middle of his Mulholland Drive compound, a lavish property that he bought through a series of transactions over a period of decades. As of 2023, Jack's home spans three acres in total, and he bought his first parcel of land way back in 1960. Following that initial purchase, Jack would pick up additional lots in 1993 and 2005, the last of which he bought off his friend, the late Marlon Brando, for $5 million. Jack and Marlon used to be neighbors, and to say that they'd get up to a lot of trouble together is probably the understatement of the century. But before I look closer into that relationship, let's take a closer look at Jack's home. The part of the estate that Jack spends the most amount of time in these days is the exact spot where Marlon's home formerly stood. Once Jack purchased that parcel back in the mid 2000s, he had Marlon's old house destroyed because it was covered in black mold. Then he built a new 3,303 square foot structure with four bedrooms and three bathrooms that he's remained in ever since. Of course, Jack doesn't have any social media, which means details and photos of the inside of this home over recent years are hard to come by. But back in the day, Jack's estate was known as Bad Boy Drive on account of the frequent celebrating 
celebrating that went on there. While living next to other notorious party animals like Marlon Brando and Warren Beatty, Jack developed a taste for a crazy lifestyle that involved drinking to excess while experimenting with harder stuff like LSD and cocaine. When it came time to LSD in particular, the memoir Nicholson, Jack's biographer Mark Elliott wrote, Jack's experiences with the drug were life-changing. He believed after taking it the first time, he had seen the face of God. He also had castration fantasies, homoerotic fantasies, and revelations about not being wanted as an infant. While living in such an expanded state of consciousness, Nicholson's Beverly Hills address became the focal point of hundreds of Hollywood parties, some of which are rumored to have been little more than thinly veiled drug-fueled orgies. On one rare occasion, when Nicholson wasn't in the process of throwing an all-time rager, he invited a photographer from Life magazine to document a few images of him at home. But even in those pictures, Jack has a hard time from refraining from his life of excess, smoking and drinking while attempting to learn piano, cut film, listen to music, and spend time with his daughter Jennifer. Since last being out in public alongside his son Ray at a Lakers game in 2021, Jack has retired to the interior of this property and seldom stepped outside since, not even to check out his 70-acre compound in Malibu that he still owns to this day. Back in 1977, Jack Nicholson was already at the top of his game, which is why he was able to afford a stunning Malibu estates that features a tennis court, putting green, a grotto-style pool, and so much more. Much like with his home in Beverly Hills, property records suggest that Jack put this estate together piece by piece, and taken in total, the acreage clocks in at an epic 75 acres. The first two parcels were purchased in July 1977 for an unknown sum. The third and final parcel was then added in January 1990, also for an unknown amount of money. Today, the single-story main structure measures just 2,313 square feet, containing three bedrooms as well as two bathrooms, plus a staff quarters with an additional bathing facility. Reports also suggest that there's a guest house in the premises as well. Shortly after buying the home, Jack and his family transformed the estate into a recreational paradise, complete with a swimming pool, party-sized spa, a fully lit tennis court, miles of private hiking trails, a cabana, and even a putting green jam-packed with a bunch of little red flags. Then in 2011, Jack decided that it might be time to move off this property. He listed the estate for $4.5 million, but ultimately decided to take it off the market, and it's remained under his ownership ever since. While not many details are known about the rest of Jack's real estate portfolio, it's believed to be in the excess of $100 million, with close to a dozen properties in total. For instance, in addition to his Beverly Hills compound, Jack owned a 1,301 square foot house in the Hollywood Hills on Woodrow Wilson Drive that he purchased in 1979 for just $49,000. Of course, it doesn't exist anymore, having burned to the ground during a fire in September 2011. 10 years later, he'd buy a 1,188-square-foot condo on Main Street in the Venice area of Los Angeles for $327,000. It's believed that this home was purchased for a woman he was seeing at the time. His property holdings also extend past Hollywood to the northern reaches of California, where reports suggest that he has a two-acre spread with modest house built on it next to Mount Shasta. Jack's also the very lucky owner of a five-bedroom, three-bathroom home on Kailua on the big island of Hawaii. But the bulk of his real estate holdings outside of LA are confined to the star-studded ski resort town of Aspen, Colorado, where Jack has owned a small condo since 1992 that he purchased for $180,000, as well as a 3,260-square-foot house outside of town and a five-bedroom, seven-bath Victorian mansion that was built in 1890 in the downtown core. Jack offloaded the downtown property in 2016 for $11 million, but still owns the other two. Not that he ever visits them. After all, it was huge news recently when Jack was spotted for the first time in 18 months, being photographed on the balcony of his Mulholland Drive pad. While standing outside his large patio doors that open up into his master bedroom, Jack was seen looking disheveled, wearing a baggy orange t-shirt and some tracksuit pants. One source reportedly told the Daily Mail, he's made it clear his home is his castle, but people just wish he'd come out of the house and pop up, tell them how, or at least 
to reassure folks he's okay. Some of Jack's friends are even worried that his reclusive nature is becoming more and more like that of his late friend, Marlon Brando. Despite living one of the most colorful lives of all time, Marlon spent his final few years totally alone before dying in 2004. The last time Jack appeared on screen was How Do You Know starring Owen Wilson and Reese Witherspoon, a film that dropped over 10 years ago. Since then, there have been rumors that he's been battling dementia, but in January, one of Jack's friends, Bill Riley, would deny any such claims, suggesting that it was nonsense. After seeing Jack courtside at a Lakers playoff game this past weekend, I'm gonna side with Bill and suggest the rumors of his demise have been exaggerated. That being said, there's no denying that one of the formerly most popular people on the planet is now spending most of his free time alone at home. In some ways, that's simply to be expected. Time catches up with all of us eventually, but when it happens to someone with as much vitality as Jack previously had, it's always noticeable. Here's hoping that Jack Nicholson is healthy and happy, and maybe we'll get lucky enough to be blessed with one last performance. All right, everyone, that's gonna bring this house tour to a close. Thanks for watching today's episode, and before before you head out, consider answering the following question. If you are formerly one of the biggest stars in the world, would you want to spend your final days alone or under the spotlight? Let me know if you'd be as reclusive as Jack has become in the comments below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to make sure you never miss an episode.